Hi, I'm Dr. Barry Sears. The title of this presentation is An Introduction to Metabolic Engineering, Understanding the Molecular Biology of Wellness. Obviously, the first question, what is wellness? Unless we can define wellness, we can't basically talk about its molecular biology. Well, if drugs treat the symptoms of chronic disease, then one definition of wellness might be is the absence of the symptoms of chronic disease. That's not a very good definition because often it doesn't take into account that it takes years for those symptoms to arise. We want to know the first moment that where our body is no longer well. Here are some other definitions. I'm just lucky. And that's not a definition that can be applied to others very easily. Or, I have good genes. That's great for you, but how does it affect somebody else who doesn't have great genes? But here's a third definition of uh, wellness that basically can be used applicable to a wide population. It'd be the absence of insulin resistance. So exactly what is insulin resistance? It means your metabolism is not working correctly. You can't look at a person and see and determine whether they have insulin resistance or not. Because 16% of people who have insulin resistance, resistance have normal weight. But for most, the first physical sign that you have insulin resistance is the accumulation of abdominal belly fat. And this is the gateway to many chronic disease states. That being said, what is the primary cause of insulin resistance? It turns out it's a pro-inflammatory diet. This also begs the question, what is a pro-inflammatory diet? Well, we can define a pro-inflammatory diet using this matrix. It could be one that has excess nutrients, such as excess calories, excess refined carbohydrates like bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, or excess omega-6 fatty acids or excess palmitic acid. It could also be a diet that's deficient in certain nutrients, such as omega-3 fatty acids and polyphenols. It could also be a diet that has an unbalanced protein to carbohydrate ratio. The more of your diet that has each of these three components, the more pro-inflammatory it is. Now, what, is, what about inflammation? Well, this was the state of NART knowledge of inflammation in 2004. This was the cover magazine of Time magazine, talking about the secret killer, the surprising link between inflammation, heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases. We would think about this as the primary cause of disease was uncontrolled inflammation. Not quite correct. Because to basically maintain wellness, you need a zone of inflammation. If you have too little of an inflammatory response, your body becomes a sitting target for microbes. Your physical injuries would never heal. But if you have too strong of an inflammatory response, the body, basically inflammation, is not resolved or turned off. And as a consequence, the body attacks itself. So to maintain wellness, we need a zone of inflammation, not too much, but not too little. So now we have our, our current understanding of inflammation is based on a more complex understanding. Inflammation, yes, it will cause damage, but it's the resolution of that inflammation that causes healing. Well, if inflammation causes damage, what controls healing? This gets a little more complex. It's what I call the resolution response. These are, these are responses buried deep in your genes. Anytime the body experiences an injury, you get acute inflammation, the uprising of inflammation. You see an increase of hormones known as acosinoids and cytokines. This causes the pain, the swelling, the redness. But it's this acute inflammation that now turns on another part of the inflammatory response, also buried deep in your genes. This is the resolution response. This is a much more complex response that requires many things happening in a sequential basis. You first have to reduce inflammation, then resolve it, and finally repair the damage. And if you do all three of these in the correct sequence, the damage heals. Let me give you an example. Let's say you cut your hand. 
Initially, there's pain, swelling, redness. That's the acute inflammation. But if your resolution response is working correctly, within a few days, the hand heals uh, completely. It's as if you turn back the hands of time. That's the resolution response. So healing really requires a, a on-demand resolution response to repair the damage caused by any inflammation. It's a highly orchestrated series of hormonal and epigenetic actions. But most importantly, each step of the resolution response can be blocked by insulin resistance. And why is this? It's because insulin resistance disrupts your metabolism. Now let's ask the question, what is metabolism? It converts the uh, control of, you know, conversion of food into energy, but it also controls your immune system. It controls the expression of your genes via epigenetics. It controls tissue regeneration. It controls your rate of aging. That's a lot. And that's why we have, why metabolism is so complex. This gives you an example. This is basically looking at pretends inside the cell, one single cell, and you have 37 trillion cells. And say, this is how metabolism works. It's a constant dynamic feedback of inputs coming from the blood to turn on and turn off various complex reactions inside your metabolism. Now, if you think metabolism is complex, the systems that control metabolism are even more complex. Again, think of this black box as an individual cell, and you have 37 trillion. Now, what you see is a traffic map that looks like Naples uh, in the summer. A complete chaos. Things going, turning on, turning off different aspects. But what controls all this is one master switch in every cell in your body. It's called AMPK. This is an enzyme that's been conserved over hundreds of millions of years. And it's the central switch for all metabolic actions. But it's under robust dietary control. And if you can control the activity of AMPK, all these other control systems now become in alignment. And so your diet becomes now the ability to control the metabolism in each of your 37 trillion cells if you only have the right diet. Now, what if you don't have the right diet? You develop a condition known as insulin resistance. What does this mean? It means your metabolism is simply not working very well. Think of insulin resistance like a champagne fountain at a wedding. Nothing is more beautiful than a champagne fountain at a wedding. It fills the first glass, it spills over the next tier, and then further and further. It's a glorious day. Unfortunately, this is the champagne fountain of basically future illness. As you build up insulin resistance, it eventually builds up in the cells and spills over into the next tier of chronic disease, diabetes. And once you have diabetes, you are now in a boatload of problems. Because once you develop diabetes, you are four times more likely to develop heart disease and twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's. That's why, why many neurologists call, call Alzheimer's diabetes type 3. But those aren't the only diseases that are affected by insulin resistance. They include obesity. We talked about diabetes, hypertension, cancer, liver disease, neurological diseases, depression, kidney diseases, atherosclerosis, and frailty. Virtually no chronic disease known in the medical science does not have a strong relation to the levels of insulin resistance. So this now leads us to what exactly is metabolic engineering? Remember, our definition of metabolic engineering was the ability of the diet to reduce insulin resistance. Well, what metabolic engineering is, it allows you to reprogram your metabolism by activating AMPK in each of your 37 trillion cells. And there are three different pathways this can be done. One is through calorie restriction. This is the most powerful way to activate AMPK. Another way is through adequate intake of polyphenols. This activates a group of enzymes known as sirtuins, and they also activate AMPK. And finally, the omega-3 fatty acids, they activate AMPK through their production and metabolism into hormones known as resolvents. 
any one of these three dietary interventions is good, but when they're all combined together, you have a powerful tool, a powerful dietary tool to activate AMPK. And so now we can look at the dietary components of metabolic engineering. The foundation is calorie restriction. Make no mistake about it, it's basically the most powerful way we have to basically live longer and live better. But we also need the omega-3 fatty acids to basically not only activate AMPK, but to resolve inflammation and the polyphenols to further activate AMPK. So this becomes now the pyramid, the dietary pyramid for metabolic engineering. This raises some questions for the polyphenols. There are 8,000 different polyphenols. Which ones to use? For the omega-3 fatty acids, how much? And for calorie restriction, is how can I do it without hunger? Because no one wants to restrict calories if they go through the rest of their life being hungry. So these are the three questions we have to resolve to understand how to apply metabolic engineering on a lifetime basis. So let's start with the polyphenols. These are AMPK activators. These are also the chemicals that give fruits and vegetables their color. And for thousands of years, that's all we thought they did. But it turns out they do a lot more. The bad news is there are some problems. They're in very low concentrations in fruits and vegetables, which means you have to eat a lot to get enough polyphenols to have any benefit on activating AMPK. Their second problem, they're not very well absorbed. If they can't get in the blood, they can't activate AMPK. And the third problem is once they get in the blood, they leave the blood fairly quickly. Their half-life is about two hours. So these are some of the problems of using polyphenols. Now how they work to activate AMPK is a little more complicated. I said how they work is to activate a group of enzymes called sirtuins. This activates an upstream regulator called LKB1. That turns on AMPK, and that basically now makes another cofactor called NAD that is the necessary cofactor for this cycle to continue. So as long as you have enough polyphenols getting into the bloodstream, you can keep the cycle going around the clock. Now, what about human data? We can talk about mice data all we want, cell cultures. What about human data? This is a study done a decade ago, taking the people who lived in the old country of Tuscany, who still followed the ancient Mediterranean diet. So the scientists thought, obviously, those who ate more polyphenols would live longer. You have a very easy uh, endpoint, death. So when they looked at mortality of these elderly uh, Italians, they found no difference between the amount of polyphenols they ate and their uh, longevity, as shown in graph B. This made no sense to the investigators. Then they realized, maybe the polyphenols to work, they have to get into the body. It's hard to measure polyphenols in the body, but they can leave the body. So you can measure their presence in the blood by their levels in the urine. And that's shown in graph A. And now they found out exactly what they're looking for. Those who had the highest levels of polyphenols in their urine live 31% longer. No drug, no other medical science, can increase lifespan by 31%. But if you take adequate levels of polyphenols that get into the blood, it comes with a uh, diet. Now, which polyphenols? I said there are 8,000. Well, there's one that basically, in many ways, is the best of the best. It's a small group of polyphenols called delphinidines. These are highly water soluble. When you add a drop of uh, delphinidines to a glass of water, it turns red almost dark red, purple, like a glass of red wine. And that's where you find most, poly most delphinidines, in red wine. The health benefits of red, drinking red wine is not the alcohol, it's the delphinidines. Now we go back to humans. Do concentrated delphinidines have any benefits in humans? The answer is yes. They reduce the levels of elevated blood sugar. How rapidly? Within eight weeks. 
Within eight weeks, you can see a remarkable drop in glycosylated hemoglobin, the primary marker used to determine whether you're a diabetic or not. They also reduce oxidative stress, a driver of basically the aging process. This study took smokers, and half the smokers got a placebo, and half got a pill containing delphinidines. Within 30 days, their levels of oxidative stress in the smokers getting the delphinidines was significantly reduced. And after they stopped taking the delphinidines, the levels of oxidative stress went right back up. So we have some now very intriguing human studies that says if you take adequate levels of delphinidines, you can begin to basically activate AMPK. What about omega-3 fatty acids? Well, it's really saying I need high dose. Placebo levels of omega-3 fatty acids are not going to work because omega-3 fatty acids are the drivers of the resolution of inflammation. Now, we think of inflammation as a raging fire that burns out the embers. It's a wonderful analogy. It's simply not true. Yes, the intensity of inflammation may decrease below the perception of pain, but it's still ongoing. It's this silent inflammation, this chronic low-level inflammation you can't feel, that's the driver of chronic disease. Remember that earlier magazine article from Time Magazine I showed you, saying the cause of heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's is basically inflammation? It's low-level chronic inflammation below the perception of pain. And how to resolve that, how to stop it, how to turn it off? You need adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids. So how do they actually resolve inflammation? Now it becomes a little more complex. Omega-3 fatty acids are the building blocks of the most powerful group of hormones known in medical science. They're called resolvents. And you make different resolvents from different omega-3 fatty acids. But if you can make adequate levels they are the agents that turn off the inflammatory response throughout the body. And here's the time course of inflammation. The initiation, when something happens that causes an inflammatory response, that's where you get the pain, the swelling, the redness, the edema. And now the pain comes from infiltration of a group of immune cells called neutrophils from the blood into the site of damage. They cause pain. They're outright killers. And then they bring in the heavy hitters. They're called macrophages. And they, too, continue to cause the pain. But somehow, magically, the macrophages are transformed from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. And what controls that magical transformation? The levels of resolvents. And if you have adequate levels in the body, you can now basically turn off the macrophages, turn them into anti-inflammatory agents, and now basically the healing process commences. How do you know if you're taking enough omega-3 fatty acids? Well, it turns out there's a simple blood test. You measure the levels of two fatty acids in the blood. One is called arachidonic acid, or AA. This is the building block of all the pro-inflammatory hormones that turn on inflammation. The other is eicosapentaenoic acid, an omega-3 fatty acid, or EPA. This is the building block of the hormones that turn off inflammation. I said earlier, you need a balance. You need a balance of both inflammation and resolution. <coughs> and the ratio of these fatty acids will tell you, with frightening certainty, what is that balance in each of your 37 trillion cells. Now, how much do you need? Well, it depends. Let's say you're well and you want to maintain wellness. What's a good definition of wellness for most people? They don't have a chronic disease and they look good in a bathing suit. Not very many people fall in that category. So how much would they need? They would need about two and a half grams of omega-3 fatty acids every day. The average American consumes about 100 milligrams. That's about only 90, only 5% of what they need. Now, your great-grandmother knew this when they gave your uh, parents a tablespoon of cod liver oil before they could leave the house. <coughs> that tablespoon of cod liver oil, disgusting as it was, 
contain two and a half grams of omega-3 fatty acids. But what if you're no longer well? What if you're obese? You have diabetes or you have heart disease? You'll need still higher levels, about five grams of omega-3 fatty acids per day. And what if you now have no longer silent pain, but chronic pain, like the pain that comes from rheumatoid arthritis? The levels are higher. And what if you have now inflammation inside the brain? You have depression, you have ADHD, you have Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis. You'll need higher levels. Make no mistake, these are high levels, but there are also therapeutic levels. And so by looking at the ratio of a rocketonic acid EPA, this will tell you how much omega-3 fatty acids you need to basically control inflammation in your body. But rather than guessing, always test. And this is why a simple blood test we've done developed using a finger stick test that tells you exactly what that ratio is. The green zone is where you want to be. Now, as you go from green to yellow, to orange, to red, you have higher and higher levels of low level chronic inflammation throughout your body. Now, if your ideal target range is between 1.5 and 3, most Americans are about 20. That's the red zone. And this explains why we have so much chronic inflammation in our society today. So again, rather than saying how much you need, the blood will tell you how much you need to maintain inflammation under control for a lifetime. But polyphenols and omega-3 fatty acids can be given as supplements. Taking supplements is easy. Put in mouth, swallow, job completed. Changing dietary habits is incredibly hard. And why is this important? Because it's dietary inhibitors of AMPK that are your, basically your primary enemy. There are some direct inhibitors like excess calories or excess glucose. There are also indirect inhibitors like excess fructose and excess protein. Any one of these, if an excess, can inhibit the activity of AMPK and basically start increasing the levels of insulin resistance in your body. Now, the big question is how to achieve calorie restriction without hunger. Because if you can do that, then changing your dietary habits has an outside chance of being successful. Now, you have three options with medical science today of how to basically constrict calories, reduce calories without hunger. One is gastric bypass surgery. Okay, a little uh, drastic, but it works. The second are the new generation of injectable weight loss drugs. But these must be taken for a lifetime because the day you stop using these injectable drugs, the weight returns. But it's not losing weight. You really want to lose excess fat. And these injectable drugs, actually about 40% of the weight loss is not fat, it's muscle mass. And there's the third aspect, the zone diet. The zone diet was developed and patented to reduce insulin resistance. It too must be followed for a lifetime if you want to basically have a longer health span. But now the zone diet has some more defined constraints. You need about 30 grams of protein at every meal. Why? You'll need to have that to control satiety. Anything less than that, satiety will start to increase. But you have to balance that 30 grams with what are called low glycemic carbs to control insulin levels. What are low glycemic carbs? They're called non-starchy vegetables. Your grandmother also knew this when she said you can't leave the table until you eat all your vegetables. Now this sounds, this is so hard. That's why we had to basically invent a new category of foods, zone foods, to make it easier. And this is why the zone diet becomes so critical to your success. Adding supplements to your body, thinking of the big bucket as your body, is easy. But what if that bucket is full of holes? What if you're inhibiting AMPK by your diet? Then all the benefits of this dietary supplementation are lost. So unless you plug those holes, 
your goal, your lifelong goal to control insulin resistance will be an ephemeral one. That's why people lose weight and regain it. Lose weight, regain it. You need a consistent dietary program that plugs those holes. And that's what the zone diet does. And that's why I said it was patented, patented in the year 2000 to treat insulin resistance. It was not patented as a diet or as a, a nutraceutical, it was patented as a drug. A drug to be taken really on a daily dosis to control insulin resistance, which is the underlying cause of the development of chronic disease. And here's how the zone diet works. <coughs> It keeps, you need to have a balance of protein to the glycemic load at every meal. And only by that can you control insulin balance and reduce insulin resistance. Now what happens if you go to the left side of the curve? You have a high carbohydrate diet. You're gonna basically have excess dietary glucose and that will inhibit and decrease AMPK activity. Well, the obvious solution, go to the other side of the curve. Follow a ketogenic diet where you have deficient levels of glucose in the diet. Now you have another problem because deficient levels of, of glucose will cause the body to increase the stress hormone cortisol. Your brain needs glucose. If you're not going to put enough glucose into your mouth, it will now release more cortisol to break down muscle mass to convert the glucose for brain function. And excess cortisol increases insulin resistance. Between those two extremes lies the answer. To reduce insulin resistance, you need to keep your diet in that zone. And the more effective you are, the faster you reduce insulin resistance. And that's why the zone diet is a calorie restricted diet without hunger, without fatigue. You're getting enough protein to stop hunger by the same mechanisms used by weight uh, reduction uh, drugs, but without fatigue because the brain is getting enough glucose that it's happy. And if the brain's happy, you're happy. Now, does it work? Well, this is one of the early studies in the 20th century, taking now both obese individuals and type two diabetics and seeing how rapidly could the zone diet reduce their levels of insulin resistance. And you can see within four days, the levels of insulin resistance were dropped dramatically in both groups before they lost one pound of weight. And after the 28 days of following the zone diet, they had lost some weight. There's a further drop, but most of the drop was actually taking place within the first four days. So this is the power of the zone diet. Within a very short time, it can reduce insulin resistance. And that's why in 2006, the Joslin Diabetes Center at Harvard Medical School started using the zone diet as their primary treatment for treating type two diabetics. <coughs> and this follows their course of five years of adding, having people follow the zone diet with constant education and basically of, of training and support by their staff. You can see in the first six months or the first three months a dramatic drop in the primary marker of uh, diabetes called glycosylated hemoglobin. And this is, they were already taking all the best diabetic drugs known to medical science. But within three months, there was a dramatic reduction. But then there was a slow increase. Why? Because the human nature took over. They said, it's too hard. Uh, I want to eat the foods I want to eat. So, it became apparent that you might get a short-term benefit, but maintaining it for a, lo a lifestyle will be very, very difficult. So how to solve this problem? We had to solve the problem by inventing a new technology. Inventing a new technology that allowed us to basically make zone foods. A technology we term as molecular baking. And what molecular baking does, and the zone foods that come from it, allows you to supply adequate protein to induce satiety, but now balanced with low glycemic carbohydrates to prevent excess insulin, but now being able to make food products which are hedonically pleasing and easy to integrate into any dietary philosophy. 
It's not telling people what they should eat. It's asking what they do like to eat. And most people will usually say the three P's. Pizza, pasta, and pastries. Molecular baking allows you to make the three P's that can be followed for a lifetime. And here are some of the typical foods you can make using molecular baking. Yes, pasta and uh, rice replacements. Bread and pasta, uh, bread and pizza. Breakfast cereals, bars, shakes, muffins, soups, cookies. You'll say, I can eat these all day long. Say, if that's what it takes to control insulin resistance, now you have a drug that will have lifetime compliance. Now, what do these meals look like? These are some of the meals using the, uh, the zone foods in a form of pasta. They say, well, that looks like an Italian uh, meal. I say, exactly. But unlike a typical Italian meal, it stops hunger because basically it contains 30 grams of protein, even though it contains only pasta and vegetables. Or I can basically use orzo as a rice replacement. Again, these are meals designed and proven to stop hunger. You have, if you want to stop hunger, you have to eat meals like this the rest of your life. But most people say, that's fine, but I like bread and pizza. And these are some of the bread products and pizza products that we've developed using the same technology. They say, I get it. I can eat hamburgers and pizza and croissants the rest of my life. The answer is yes. And the reason why because the drug, the zone diet, is built into the bread. Just add as many low glycemic carbohydrates as you possibly can between the two pieces of bread or on top of the pizza. Now, does it work? That's why you do science. This is one of our published studies we did at Arizona State. We basically took uh, overweight individuals and basically gave them controlled meals equal number of calories. They couldn't tell the difference. Some of the meals were using gluten-free uh, pasta or gluten-free uh, cereals, and others were using zone foods. And this is the drugs they were getting. They had to come now to the university and pick up their drugs every week. No thinking involved. And what were the results? Well, if we looked at just weight, there's no difference because both groups were following a calorie-restricted diet. But it's not weight you're looking to lose. You're looking to lose fat and actually hopefully gain muscle. And now you see the differences. Those who are eating the zone foods, even though the calorie intake was exactly the same, they were actually gaining muscle mass. That's the holy grail of calorie restriction. Lose fat, gain muscle. And they were losing twice the fat as those who were getting the placebo meals. And both of these were highly statistically significant. And when you look at the levels of insulin resistance, you find even a more striking aspect. The levels of insulin resistance drop dramatically in those eating the zone foods, and there's no change whatsoever in those following a calorie-restricted diet, but using their regular foods. So again, we always have to say, show me the data in humans that does it work. So, if your goal is to reduce insulin resistance, you need an integrated dietary approach. You need a combination of the zone diet, and zone foods make it easier, omega-3 fatty acids, and polyphenols. And if all three are working together, you get into the zone. The zone is not some mystical place. The zone is defined by your blood. It's defined by your level of insulin resistance. And so here we can now define the zone. Basically, it is keeping HOMA IR less than one. And by doing so, you're constantly activating AMPK. And it's this optimization of AMPK activity that leads to the slowing of the aging process. But as of all things, you need a roadmap. And that's why the zone is no different, because we're not all genetically the same. You need a roadmap to adjust your diet for your dietary philosophy and your genetics. And here's how you do it. You can look at the ratio of the triglycerides to HDL in their blood. It should be less than one. And that is most affected by the zone diet. 
the ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA in your blood should be between 1.5 and 3. That will be most affected by omega-3 fatty acids. And your glycosylating hemoglobin should be between 4.9 and 5.1%. That is most affected by the polyphenol intake that get into your blood. So by using these three simple blood tests, you can now fine tune, personalize the diet for your genetics and your dietary philosophy to reduce insulin resistance. It's not personalized nutrition, it's personalized medicine. And so what metabolic engineering is, it's a dietary system to activate AMPK. If you can activate AMPK, it's the key, the necessary key to reducing insulin resistance. That will enhance healing and coordinate epigenetic signaling in every cell in your body. And so what metabolic engineering is, is a defined dietary pathway to maintain wellness. Thank you very much.